Uh, we're going to turn it over to Braden Murdoch uh, from George Washington uh, in case of picks. So. Okay, so as was mentioned, my name is Braden Murdoch coming from George Washington University. I'm going to present a patient who came in with a PIC, punctate intercordopathy. So for the patient, um, she was a 33-year-old, uh, previously healthy female who came in with this light spot in her central vision that had been going on for two weeks. Uh, initially, she had been seen by an outside provider who had referred her in, and she said that this light spot had persisted um, with some photophobia and just general eye discomfort, but otherwise denied any pain, swelling, uh, photopsias, headaches, floaters, or other visual distortions. Uh, so for her, kind of just a, a timeline for her initial presentation um, to provider was about a week after the symptoms started. At that point, they did some imaging. Unfortunately, uh, we do not have that imaging at this time, so I'm just going to kind of describe what we looked at uh, from the patient's phone. Uh, MAC OCT was performed uh, showing a PED temporal dilophobia with some subretinal fluid. Uh, color photos of the left eye also showed some ovoid yellow uh, hazy region in the same region. As well as on the FA, there were these two hyperfluorescent uh, lesions in the laminar phase of this left eye. So at that time, this macular lesion, kind of unknown etiology, uh, they started Bactrim DS for what they suspected was possibly an infectious uh, cause, and they asked her to come back in a week. So at a week's time, she followed up, had additional imaging. Uh, color photos <coughs> showed these new punctate lesions uh, in the temporal region um, from the macula, as well as um, on the FA, she had many punctate hyperfluorescent spots temporal to the macula, which was changed from before. So there was some concern that the bactrim wasn't working and this might be something else. So she was actually referred here for an evaluation for a possible multifocal choroiditis or another white dot syndrome. Um, so when she initially presented uh, to us, the past medical history, ocular history, and social history was really non-contributory. Uh, on exam, really the only finding we had from her visual acuity was that the left was a little bit worse than the right, but she didn't have any correction, so that'll be important later. Otherwise, pressure ocular movements were normal. On the slit lamp exam, it was notable for uh, vitreous cell, rare vitreous cell in the left eye, uh, right eye being normal. Left eye also noted in the macula those same yellowish spots that were noted before by the outside provider. Uh, a couple of those in the, in the temporal region from the macula. So we had imaging done at that time, and I will preface that by saying that she was actually outside of network. So we didn't perform uh, all the imaging that we would have liked to because she was paying out of pocket for these uh, imaging studies. But from what we did uh, ascertain, we had uh, FA, er, er, autofluorescence, and a C, uh, OCT performed. As we can see here on the left, uh, it's a little bit difficult on the projector there, but there's these punctate lesions kind of spanning temporally to the macula uh, that are kind of you know, limited by the superior and inferior arcades. On the OCT on the right there, we can see it um, looks like the, the PEDs actually increase in size from what we were able to see from her phone record. Um, as well as we have like this sub RPE accumulation and this overlying heterogeneous uh, hyperreflective substance that's possible SRF temporal to the macula there with some disruption of the ISOS junction. So optos, uh, pretty similar to the autofluorescence that we saw before with those uh, punctate lesions in the same distribution. So for her, the assessment and plan so with her presentation and worsening with the Bactrim basically not being uh, helped in any regard, the differential was pretty broad. Uh, a lot of the posterior uveitides were considered, especially since she didn't have any anterior inflammation or uh, intermediate signs of, inf excuse me, of inflammation. We did also consider like a sarcoidosis or an autoimmune cause to this. Uh, at that time with the OCT imaging, the thing we were most concerned about was this PED and CNVM in the left eye. So we thought that this was probably most likely secondary to inflammation, um, although we did also consider other causes of the CNBM. In her age group, myopia would be a common cause, uh, trauma, and macular degeneration in an older patient. So those really didn't fit the bill for her. So we decided to proce proceed with anti-VEGF therapy. So ILEA was given in office. Uh, steroids were considered, but we wanted to rule out any infectious cause. And then immunomodulation therapy was also considered. 
Uh, if this were to progress or recur in that same eye or spread to the other eye, uh, we would consider it more. She was told to follow up in a week, um, and we had etiology workup, which is basically the lab work that we do for um, common causes of uveitis, including uh, sarcoid, TB, syphilis, toxo, CBC, and CMP, just to uh, complete that. So she returned about a week later, a few days later, and her vision was a little bit more distorted than before uh, after finishing her antibiotic uh, course. Otherwise, her exam was stable. No imaging was performed at that time. All of her lab work had come back completely normal. So we felt confident at this point to initiate uh, PO steroid therapy to see if we could help improve her symptoms. Um, of note, we were interested in doing an osrodex implantation, but due to her out-of-network status, Cost, prohibit, cost prohibited uh, nature of Ozodex, we considered, uh, we continued with the PO steroid therapy. So we had her come back in a week um, to look at things, and this is the imaging at that point. So the autofluorescence is a little bit difficult to tell, but there is some resolution to those punctuate, punctate lesions. Most starkly, uh, in what we can see significant from the OCT is there is a great regression of that edema and flattening of that PED. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, her vision was basically the same as it was, uh, so there's probably some residual fibrosis, maybe even some changes there that were affecting her vision. Um, so that was actually the most recently that we saw her. She's a patient currently followed, so we'll be seeing her in a few weeks to kind of evaluate her further. So I wanted to talk about PIC, which I was completely new to the, the world of uveitis from this rotation, and it's a world that is just completely fascinating to me. So PIC is one of the most rare of the uh, posterior UV entities, first described in 1984 in 10 myopic females who were really noted for blurred central vision, photopsia, paracentral scotoma, and this yellow-gray lesion kind of in the same distribution. Um, incidence is estimated 1.6 in a million. Uh, the data is super sparse as far as um, how they're actually able to recognize patients with this disease. So it's likely that it's more common than this, but this is what's on the books. As far as pathogenesis, the main thing that's been proposed that this is like an autoimmune uh, response to some uh, polygenic environmental stimulation, be it uh, you know anything from infection, immunization, to stress. Um, common clinical presentations is basically what I presented here today. Uh, healthy, although our patient was not myopic, Caucasian females in their 30s with the scotoma blurred vision, um, and then you know the other things that are mentioned there, metamorphosia. Uh, so the diagnosis is really difficult because it's kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, imaging is, is helpful, but it's not going to uh, sense the diagnosis for us. I'm not gonna really delve into the findings uh, at this time, but I do want to tell, uh, explain that ICG is actually probably one of the more helpful diagnostic features as this pathology occurs at the RPE uh, junction. So we, we do see that on, on the ICG as it um, illuminates the uh, choroid. Uh, so that would probably be the most helpful for us in diagnosing uh, this disease, although that wasn't performed at this time. OCT may also help support. Um, the diagnosis as well as the treatment and management for a lot of these patients who have CNVM that can be treated and improve visual outcomes. And then of note as well, I can't, I can't go on without saying that um, FLEO imaging is also being studied. Actually here at the Moran there was an ARVA presentation by one of the residents I hear, um, Dr. Jenscher, who basically looked at FLEO imaging to evaluate active lesions versus inactive lesions and possible response to therapy. So I think that's probably going to be the future. I wanted to present more, but the time constraints is such. Uh, so treatment, it ranges, and it kind of depends on the patient's presentation. Obviously, um, it, with our patient being so close to the fovea, we wanted to implement treatment quickly. But in a lot of patients, uh, observation is, is perfectly fine. Um, the, uh, depending on you know, their response to treatment, it may uh, be, uh, like I mentioned, with anti-VEGF, or immunomodulation and steroid therapy, and there's some mixed um, literature about what's been done and what's been effective. Um, so I think a lot of more information needs to be had on that and research uh, with that. Um, and then as far as the clinical course, um, it does, uh, without CNVM, the visual acuity and, and visual response is actually quite good in this, in this disease. 
Um, I wanted to mention probably the most important thing from this is uh, there's a lot of things that can be similar to uh, PIC in, in presentation. The things that are really big takeaways from PIC is that there is no vitritis. So it is like this posterior inflammation that doesn't have intermittent or anterior inflammation. It does involve the chorioretinal layers with these small lesions, uh, which is different from other pathology. And it's strictly uh, limited to the posterior pole. And there is scarring uh, and CNVM versus other diseases like MUSE, which uh, don't have that. So that is my presentation there. There are my references. And special thanks to my preceptor, Dr. Marcel Rochelle, and Jim Gilman and Glenn Jenkins for their imaging. Thank you.